Welcome everyone to Women in an Expanding Nation, California Women in the Gold Rush Era. This is our lecture on the American West uh, of the 19th century, and in particular women's experiences in the American West, focusing particularly on the history of California women during the Gold Rush Era. And when we start talking about the American West, we're talking about one of the great mythologies of American history. The story of the westward pioneers uh, has become, I think, in a hundred years or so uh, since its historical uh, origins. Um, actually, now that I think about it, even longer than that, if we're talking about the gold rush, we're talking about over 150 years ago. Uh, but regardless where we might uh, choose a starting point, it's this, that movement westward, that, that flow of mostly English-speaking Protestant Christian people across the North American plains, uh, past the Mississippi River, uh, toward the Rocky Mountains and the Pacific Coast that constitutes the great mythic story. And I say mythic story not because uh, it never happened, but because in the retelling of that history, uh, the story became pretty quickly mythologized. Uh, comparing the mythic account to what were often the first person accounts, you'll start to see what I mean. Listen to Luzina Wilson, an actual migrant uh, of that Western passage. Nothing, she writes, but the actual experience will give one an idea of the plodding, unvarying monotony, the vexations, the exhaustive energy, the throbs of hope, the depths of despair through which we lived. Uh, that sounds pretty realistic to me for a people who are covering uh, really a few thousand miles of open country in covered wagons uh, and on foot, uh, one, I think, in reality would expect those sorts of things. And so we'll try to pay attention to how that basic reality had become mythologized in the retelling of the story. Uh, the retelling of a story that often posited a wild frontier, uh, a wilderness, uh, home only to wild animals and or savage peoples, that is, native peoples who were seen in the mythic version as being in some basic way an obstruction to American Anglo expansion. At least that's how it usually plays out in the cowboy westerns of Hollywood's imagination or even in the cowboys and Indians games that children play. Uh, when in fact, really the frontier and the migration westward, and we're talking about the pioneer uh, element here, uh, was a story of families on the move. Uh, families on the move. There were few servants, few enslaved people to tend to the women's labor uh, along the uh, continental uh, passage uh, and so women did what women have always done. Women worked uh, with their hands exhaustively. Women's labor was critical uh, to the passage westward. There was great gender disparity. Uh, most women were either mothers or wives, or as we see in the picture here, very young daughters. There were relatively few unmarried women of marriageable age, which created a rather disproportionate ratio of male to female. We'll talk about that uh, a bit more as we go on. Uh, but however we, we divide it up, this is a story of women's lives, that is the expansion of America. However, it's depicted in its mythic reality, often behind the rootin' tootin', six-gun shootin' cowboy western. Uh, women were more than just, uh, you know, barmaids or dance hall girls, as they sometimes seem in those Hollywood Western. Women uh, fulfilled all kinds of roles, uh, contributed all kinds of labor to the overall Western expansion of the United States. 
Was it that mythic story of trailblazing adventure? Well, again, six to eight months of grueling travel, living in tents, working uh, the live long day from sunrise in the morning to sunset in the evening. Uh, remember, women are not just contributing their physical labor to the onward movement. They are also, uh, in effect, maintaining their domestic labors as well, uh, keeping house, as it were, with the covered wagons uh, and the, uh, the pack trains, uh, finding needed supplies, arranging food and meals, uh, you know, patching up the kids when they fell into a bramble bush or skin their knees, applying ointments and herbal remedies. In other words, the full range of domestic duties one might uh, find a woman uh, maintaining in a settled home environment were also now thrust upon her in the migratory movement westward. Uh, and leaving most of what they would have considered their support networks uh, behind of friends and neighbors and relatives and others who might have contributed uh, women often now found themselves rather isolated, even within the larger migration trains, rather isolated uh, from those support networks. And of course, you know, dealing with the, the natural elements uh, from the changing topography uh, and seasonal climates of the, of the open plains to the Rocky Mountains, the dry deserts of Utah and Nevada, we all know about the Donner Party and their uh, ordeal uh, in the snows of the Sierra. So yeah, there was all kinds of natural elements to deal with. Something we probably take for granted being part of the automobile generation as we speed along the highway in our air-conditioned, insulated automobiles. Uh, and not surprisingly, mortality was a big part of this story. That is, death due to injury, death due to disease. Note, not death due to Indian attack. That's the mythic uh, version. There was precious little of that, and what there was was always greatly exaggerated, of course, in the, in the reports uh, of the newspapers of back east. But far more uh, likely, far more real were the everyday dangers associated with the Western uh, travel. Listen to Catherine Sager. I got the hem of my dress caught on an axle handle, precipitating me under the wheels, both of which passed over me, badly crushing my left leg. Yeah, the kind of grievous injury or accident such as Catherine Sager described. Fortunate she was to have survived it, to later write about it. Agnes Stewart wrote, Oh, Martha, what I would give to see you now. I miss you more than I can find words to express. I do not wish to forget you, but your memory is painful to me. I will see you again. I will, if I am ever able, I will go back. Agnes Stewart, longing for home, longing for her friendship with uh, Martha. Who was Martha? A sibling, a neighbor. Uh, it didn't matter. This was about... Uh, a sense of loneliness, a sense of isolation that women often experienced. According to Elizabeth Goltra, this morning some of our cattle are sick and we hardly know what is the matter. Many have died around us during the night and this morning. It is a prevailing opinion that swimming the river so choked up with dust causes irritation of the lungs as they bleed very freely at the nose and mouth just before they die. So not only the plight of the human uh, migrants, but also the stock and cattle and herds of domesticated animals that they took with them. Uh, we're focusing in this lecture on California, and uh, so there's no beating around the bush here. Clearly, the great opening of the California West came now uh, following California's uh, annexation uh, by the United States from Mexico, uh, an annexation that is uh, 
made good by war in the Mexican War of 1846 and 1847. Uh, well, shortly following that annexation, of course, the famous gold rush. Gold fever struck California by 1849 after James Marshall's famous discovery in the foothills just outside of Sacramento. From 4,000 overland migrants to California in 1848 to more than 30,000 in 1849, the West teemed with immigrants ethnically and culturally diverse uh, who labored amidst the generally harsh conditions of the Western mining districts. For those who were either early enough or lucky enough to stake a profitable claim, riches could await. But with each passing month, declining amounts of gold and growing competition made a big strike less likely. Luckless in the gold fields, many turned to other occupations to earn a living, including women who labored to find their own place in the fast evolving country. Yeah, as that passage suggests, I think the California gold rush was almost as much about uh, the people who didn't actually find gold as it was the people who did. And in the mining camps of California and the cities and towns that built up around them, towns like Sacramento and San Francisco, uh, the story of those who found little luck uh, in their uh, gold seeking uh, adventures nevertheless become the stuff of not only California history but of women's history. And so we look at gold rush women and we look at the experiences and conditions to be found in the western mining camps. Typically miners settled in camps or boom towns as they were called wherever there might be reports of a gold discovery seemingly overnight hastily built structures at first better little better than tents and shanties became the raw stuff of new communities now oriented around gold mining yes but also the various and sundry services that went along to support it so a kind of improvisational quality in the beginning something that was being made up as folks went along these camps or boom towns became notorious for their hard luck stories for their hard living for drunkenness for gambling uh, even violence including merger uh, murder and often vigilante violence that is citizens committees being formed as a counter to the kind of rough and tumble violence and crime that occurred and so vigilante citizens committees and and they all the towns had them including san francisco uh, by the early 1850s uh, organized to take the law into their own hands uh, and to quell or quash the tide of crime and violence for every hundred men there were uh, typically approximately no more than a handful of women three women to every hundred men by one census count so uh, you might say that to be a woman uh, in the western mining towns was to be outnumbered uh, and with all the subsequent uh, expectation and need and pressures that went along with that prostitutes yes uh, some women turn to the sex trade uh, to uh, earn their living, to provide for their subsistence. Bret Hart, uh, a famous writer of the West, captured life in the settlements in stories such as The Luck of Roaring Camp, a short story by Bret Hart, The Luck of Roaring Camp, where a dying prostitute leaves her newly born child to be raised by a group of drunkards, criminals, and gamblers. So really the stuff of Western tragedy. But as we'll see, it would be a huge mistake, the kind of mistake that I was warning about yesterday in the little screencast I did for you, to take the example, uh, and sometimes tragic example, of a prostitute's life and to somehow writ large make that the representative example. Uh, it's certainly part of the Western experience, and part of the women's experience, but certainly not the only one. Albert Bernard commented, nearly all these women at home were streetwalkers of the cheapest sort, but out here for only a few minutes they ask a hundred times as much as they were used to getting in Paris. Uh, 
a whole night costs from 200 to 400 dollars so a king's ransom you might say but in, a, in the the uh, ever fluid um you know windfall economy of the gold districts 200 to 400 dollars a night could be commanded by a woman who was willing to in effect uh use the market you might say to uh, better her position uh, through the sex trade in other words through prostitution there were other kinds of working women in the gold rush there was certainly a huge demand for goods and services uh, many of which though relatively daily and normal uh, would now fetch exorbitant prices due to their high demand there was certainly a niche economy for women women who could uh, open or run or manage boarding houses for example or maybe laundries or restaurants uh, they included women like Mary Ellen Pleasant here you see to the left uh, an African-American woman who ran a boarding house and restaurant uh, in San Francisco and became an independent and successful businesswoman uh, at a time in which such an endeavor would have been far more difficult uh, on the East Coast due to the prevailing market patterns and gender norms of the East Coast. But in the more fluid, open environment of California, such a thing was possible. Uh, here's Luzina Williams, who we just quoted a minute ago, who made her fortune in California. A man, her, a man had approached her, she recalled, as she cooked supper one day and offered her, quote, $10.00 which would be equivalent now to about 240 of our dollars, $10 for bread made by a woman. So baking bread she did and ultimately parlayed that into a lucrative uh, tenure as a provider, not only of bread, but of food supplies to the mining camps. Spotlight now on uh, a woman uh, from Northern California named Annie Bidwell, Annie Kennedy Bidwell. Perhaps better remembered today is the wife of the man who founded the town of Chico, California. Annie Bidwell was in her own right, though, a political force. Through her work with the YWCA and various reform causes, including temperance and women's suffrage, Bidwell transformed the moral, uh, uh, transferred the moral imperative of the women's sphere to the public sphere of moral reform. That work included her efforts to uplift California's Native American population, chiefly by substituting the values of Anglo-American culture, mostly through Christian religion and civilizing, so-called civilizing impulses through religious and educational instruction. Uh, and the reason, one of the reasons Annie Bidwell is interesting to us here is because all this is happening in California. Uh, but it reminds us that California was now thoroughly connected through the transit of migratory peoples, through the expansion of the railroad, the arrival of steamships, the telegraph wire, uh, in other words, connected in myriad ways to the rest of the country. And so what Eastern concerns of the Victorian era held for well-to-do women reform causes, moral uplift causes, and the like, uh, would also be eagerly embraced by a woman of property and wealth like Annie Bidwell in California. So being in the far off West did not isolate, uh, at least not isolate well-to-do women by the 1860s and 70s from what their uh, Eastern sisters uh, were going on about. Uh, another example of women's experience comes through the published uh, work known as The Shirley Letters uh, by the writer Louise Clapp, who wrote under the pen name Dame Shirley. Louise Clapp traveled with her physician husband uh, throughout California during the Gold Rush period and settled in the town of Quincy in the northern California county of Plumas, during the gold rush years, writing her observations of life in the mining camps and boom towns. Like Annie Bidwell, Clapp expressed the basic assumptions of Christian true womanhood even as she carved a career for herself as a writer. That is a middle-class standard of white 
independent, propertied Christian women. There was a widow whom we used to call the long woman, wrote Louise Clapp in her Shirley letters. She had come on, or excuse me, she had buried her husband who died of cholera. She had come on, for what else could she do? What really interested me so much in her was the dogged and determined way in which she had set that stern, wrinkled face of hers against poverty. She owned nothing in the world but her team, and yet she planned all sorts of successful ways to get food for her small, or rather large, family. So just a vignette, just a description of one woman observed by Louise Clapp and, and characterized in her popular series of articles called The Shirley Letters. And it's interesting because even though she was a Victorian woman, uh, rather refined, propertied, married woman, uh, she did not flinch from characterizing the harsher realities, particularly of women's lives, such as the widowed immigrant woman here that she's describing. So we do get a pretty good, almost anthropological view of the diversity of women's experiences in California uh, from the, uh, the works of uh, Louise Clapp. Uh, in fact, her writing wrestled with this question of what was the proper sphere for women, the proper role of respectable women. And we've seen this in some of our earlier discussions where there is this presumption to somehow define what it really is to be a woman, what it means to be ladylike. Usually it's some culture-bound, ethnocentric definition uh, that is propagated by those of privilege uh, and so someone like Louise Clapp really struggled with that because clearly in California there was so much um, that was unsettled, so much that wasn't simply elegant, uh, so much that wasn't, you know, refined. Uh, and even someone like Louise herself could be uh, the object of criticism for being outspoken, for being presumptuous enough, presumptuous enough uh, to write about these sorts of, uh, of things. Critics said that such women ruined their complexions by speaking in public. How can they so far forget the sweet, shy coquetries of shrinking womanhood as to don those horrid bloomers? So criti critics of the modern woman, horrid bloomers refer to the fashionable pants that women wore, uh, uh, particularly in the West. Not uh, a small amount also of ethnic and racial animosity, prejudice toward Native American women, uh, described as degraded wretches, noted for their ugliness of features. These are the, the sort of harsh and cruel ethnocentric judgments made uh, by women, uh, uh, toward women in the West. The general hideousness of their faces, said one account. Louise Clapp herself, uh, these poor withered creatures who are seldom seen far from the encampment do all the drudgery and they generally appear in a startlingly unsophisticated state of almost entire nudity. So despite being sometimes the object of criticism herself, Louise Clapp certainly had the kind of cultural snobbery to her uh, in describing uh, diverse women with a certain amount of value judgment, you might say, mixed in. Outside the cultural frame of most white women were the indigenous women of the West, that is the native women of the West. California's native population was uh, general, in general devastated by the forces unleashed with the gold rush. This is not a happy story for native Californians. Skyrocketing demand for land inevitably squeezed native peoples onto smaller and smaller parcels of government-defined reservations, uh, usually at the point of a gun as various wars uh, carried out by the U.S. government and by California voluntary militias uh, that is, Anglo militias carried out against native peoples, forcing them onto reservation lands while disease, war, racism, and poverty pushed them off the margins of California's political sphere. Census figures reported a drop in native population from around 150,000 in 1850, so at the time of the gold rush, about 150,000 native Californians to just 30,000 10 years later. 
part of which was reflected the declining fertility of Native women uh, due to, among other things, the sexually transmitted diseases contracted from migrant men, either through rape or when prostitution became a last resort. So in some cases, Native women left infertile by uh, sexually transmitted diseases, but uh, far more commonly it would have been simply the destruction of local cultures and economies that left Native peoples often destitute and dependent. A struggle to maintain independence amidst the tide of white migration and military attack. One of the few accounts of white migration left by a Native woman is that of Sarah Winnemucca, that is the writings of Sarah Winnemucca, a Paiute woman of Nevada who wrote her autobiography, Life Among the Paiutes, published in 1883. They came like a lion, yes, said Sarah Winnemucca, referring to the whites, like a roaring lion, and have continued so ever since. And certainly Sarah Winnemucca knew of which she spoke. 29 members of her Paiute tribe were killed by U.S. cavalry, including her own mother, in a uh, destructive and violent attack typical of the many such attacks carried out by the U.S. military and state militias against tribal peoples in the West. Sarah Winnemucca became an advocate uh, for her people due to her mastery of English, her literary qualities. Following the internment of her Paiute tribe in a concentration camp in Yakima, Washington, Winnemucca lobbied Congress and the President of the United States for their release. She worked as an advocate for Native people imprisoned in America and after the publication of her book in 1883, traveled as an author and lecturer throughout the country. With her proceeds, she founded a school for Native children in Lovelock, Nevada. She earned both praise and criticism from other Native leaders for urging Native people to assimilate into white culture. And that was the basic divide at the time for Native people. The choice between trying to maintain a semblance of independence and traditional culture uh, against the overwhelming pressures of white migration and military expansion uh, or to, in effect, uh, assimilate, to become now part of that larger Anglo uh, world of home and family and farming and business and schooling, etc. Well, obviously, there were great differences of opinion on this, those who were proud and sought to to uh, to maintain the cultures of their ancestors, and those who, like Sarah Winnemucca, I think, decided that the battle was a losing proposition, and so encouraged others to make their peace with assimilation. Within the diverse population also were the Californios, that is, people of Spanish and Mexican in, uh, ancestry. Originally, the wives and daughters of elite families that received large California land grants from Spain and Mexico, these women saw their status and well-being challenged by California's transformation from a Mexican state prior to the Mexican War of 1847 and 48 to its status as an American state during the gold rush years. Often widowed or otherwise left to fend for themselves as family land claims were either lost or simply confiscated by the new Anglo arrivals. These Californias sometimes married the newcomers to try and preserve what property they had. That's the same sort of choice faced by the Native American women, as we were just saying. Though the new U.S. laws often gave them little legal assurance of control or possession of property. That's because not even for white women in this Anglo society, was there any real legal protection for property? Uh, and so in that sense, uh, Latin women, that is Latino women, Californias, uh, along with Anglo women, were really left dependent on typically white male uh, patriarchs and property owners for their own independence. 
As your authors write in our Through Women's Eyes textbook, many Californians uh, followed the path of Indian women into landlessness, landlessness, domestic service, and poverty. And finally, back to the mythic image where we started. A more celebrated and sensational view of womanhood also emerged from the Western experience, largely from the fanciful imagination of a Wild West experience. Born in Ohio, Annie Oakley became something of a celebrity in the Gilded Age for her astonishing skills as a marksman and trickshot specialist, appearing in the popular Buffalo Bill's Wild West shows, then favored by Eastern audiences, Oakley became part of a mostly mythical tapestry of life in the Wild West that fueled an industry of dime novels and Wild West shows and later Hollywood movies. Anglo-Americans have long enjoyed thinking of the Wild West as a place where the normal rules of their civilization could be suspended and where a woman like Annie Oakley could become a heroine quite outside the normal boundaries of Victorian true womanhood. Well, Annie Oakley was a real person, but it was the Annie Oakley of show business, of the Wild West shows, that became the mythic character of the Western imagination. And separating that mythic from the real is, uh, again, a big part of what we're trying to do uh, in our course this summer. Uh, not so that we can forget about or dismiss the mythic, but that we can tell the difference between the true historical and mythically embellished uh, experiences of women uh, in American history. So when life becomes myth, that's where we start looking for the interesting intersections of fact and imagination. And certainly Annie Oakley, a real woman who became a mythic character, is a good example of that. All right, so that's it. That's just our, uh, our uh, highlight, you might say, of women's experiences in the West. Your textbook chapter will cover the subject in a bit broader uh, detail, but we uh, now will uh, wrap up here uh, to move on to our next uh, chapters of women's experience uh, in American history.